together. It's so good to be in front of a live audience again and not online at all times. Um, so, welcome. Thank you for letting you all join. Can you all hear me? Yes. Ready in the microphone? No. Thank you. <laughs> I have a fear of microphone. Um, all right, it's great to have you all here. Uh, my name is Richard Rieger. I'm the founder of Project Responsibility. And tonight we're going to be talking about the race to zero, how we kind of will kind of get to carbon neutral by 2070. Um, very quickly, collector responsibility, we're a sustainable consulting agency working primarily with large brands but also entrepreneurs, trying to figure out how to define and deploy sustainability in China, but also at some point in Asia, if we can get back to airplanes again and fly around, that would be nice. Um, actually, I had a friend fly from New York to Singapore today, and he's the only person on the plane. So there's hope that there might be more room. Um, but we've been working a lot with uh, firms and brands, and we have some of our clients here at Sunny. And all we're trying to do through this platform, really, uh, tonight, is to move the needle from awareness to scale. So I'm a firm believer that you have to start with, like, what is this problem? Who's doing something? What can you do? That's awareness. And hopefully, if you enjoy this event, if you enjoy the pizza that's been provided by our amazing sponsor, the space by our amazing sponsor, then we'll have engagement ready. And then, hopefully over time, you get from capacity to scale. We shouldn't be looking at how we can always kind of, you know, we're helping them or vice versa. It's got to come from internal or from the community itself. So, building a business case for sustainability, I think is really important. I was just talking about you know, the, the U.S. versus China, the government can get things done, but I kind of also like the fact that Trump pulled out of everything and the market had to work out a model and started to overall. I mean, solar's been taking off without the subsidies, so phenomenal. Um, and established collaboration, public and private, but also within you guys. Um, we're trying to rebuild this community. Uh, we have this great group of people, 100, 150, every time coming in, and I really want to bring that back because it's so energizing to be around each other and also to kind of figure out like, what can we do. Because I think being in China right now, it is an amazing time, not just because we don't have to wear face masks like most of the world, but also because sustainability really is a hot topic. It's a very tangible topic. It's something people want to work on. Um, okay, so I would invite you to scan our QR code if you want to learn more about our company, but also, more importantly, these are our upcoming events. So this is the first of a series of nine. And for those of you that are sustainability entrepreneurs and leaders, we have a few others that are behind the scenes. But we're really trying to click through the different aspects of sustainability. We're not going too deep in the technical, you know, as a, as a product, but really offering up the opportunity for brands and for, for leaders to come in and share on different important topics. And circularity and sustainability consumers would be a, a really good one for the summer. Um, all right, we're all here. We all know the Earth has got problems with rising sea levels and some species. What I love about China is that you can look at this picture and see the best and worst. I think for most of you, I've been here for 20 years, and a lot of I see a lot of faces have been here for a long time. You know, there's only like three buildings in this picture 20, 25 years ago. And when I look at that, I'm like, wow, economic development, and I think all the people's lives that have been elevated through this process, that hockey stick GDP, phenomenal. But the negative externalities of that is what we should be focused on. And that's coming through these systems. You know, so to make a city work, you need all these systems, food, energy, labor, um, healthcare system, education. And we want to keep all those things elevated. Like we don't want that sliding back down. So, you know, we see this every once in a while. This is a negative externality. Now this is 2014, and I think most of you, if you're in town, you probably remember those days where you probably had to use your, your, your flashlight to get across the street sometimes. Um, you know, some people always had these pictures of like the, the bright shiny lights. Um, I had a, I had a Year-old, so you're like, oh my God, how much shovel I'm going to do? Um, you know, can we go outside and play today or not? But what I loved about it was that the whole world is talking about climate change and polar bears and solar panels. And we're talking about air pollution, and it wasn't just Shanghai or just Beijing. It was the whole country. Um, this is 140 cities mapped out for their average API AQI for the year. But I'm actually updating this right now to see what every year looks like afterwards because there's been such an improvement, and I think it's tangible. Like, we did not make this much progress from that picture to today as we have in carbon overall. And that's because it's, it's in your face. You can't afford it. Um, the, the first conversations that we were having right back then were, okay, this was the energy mix, and this kind of serves up today. 
In 2010, 77% of China's energy came from coal. 18 came from hydro. So we hear how much renewables there are in China, 20%. It was almost all back to the dam. Three Gorges was the biggest one at the time. But how are we going to get there? A lot of talk about solar and wind, geothermal, but the renewables that we kind of think of in the Western mindset, what's going to happen there? Well, best case scenario, they were hoping for 10% wind, and you know, that would knock down hydro with it, but nuclear was going to come on in a big way. Don't go out yet. Um, although it's going back to the rear pizza. And then by 2050, the best way for us to get down to carbon neutral, if we were looking at it about five years ago, was that you know, nuclear becomes the big, the big jump, but also this is paired back to a significant demand side. And I think a lot of times when we talk about energy and we talk about carbon and we talk about cities, we don't talk enough about demand side, and which is where we have some speakers tonight. We also have some speakers talking about carbon, and we have some talking about manufacturing and taking that down as close to zero as possible over the course of years, not days. Um, but China's like, yeah, we're just going to install a bunch of solar panels. And they blew through five years of subsidies in about two quarters. Which, you know, hey, congratulations. I mean, that's amazing. But is that the only answer? And so that's kind of how I want to start the conversation tonight. Because China has this amazing challenge, it has this amazing opportunity, and it has a lot of talent. I think the intention has definitely shifted in the last 10 to 15 years from something that we can think about it later. Make money now. It's not our problem. It's the West's fault. It, there was all these reasons for not acting, but now you can already see like the action is coming. And so I'm really happy to have the speakers that we have tonight to talk about their own experience, their insights, and hopefully to find a way to engage with each of you. Um, First off, I'd like to thank our sponsors for tonight, and then Manuel is going to come here and speak in a second. Uh, from WeWork, uh, they're supporting our space tonight, and from How Food, who are uh, supporting the pizza. If you've not had the pizza, it's phenomenal. Um, I'm flexitarian, more carnivorian, um, but their products are really amazing, and I think they've been really helpful in, in supporting us. And you know, building a great brand is, is a small group of you know young female entrepreneurs trying to just kill this market. So please scan their QR code. I'll show it later. All right, so we have, as I mentioned, a great panel of speakers coming up, and I'll invite them up one by one. I'll let them introduce themselves because I'm never good at doing the introductions for other people in your life work. Uh, we have Professor Zhao who will be speaking. Uh, she's from the China UK Low Carbon College. She'll be speaking about policy, but also some tools and also some things that she's been seeing in market opportunities. Uh, Fun and Peter, they'll be talking much more about buildings. They represent the CBRE, which if you don't know who they are, I hope that they will. Tell you a little bit better than I can, but through property management, they help both developers trying to figure out what to build, investors how to put money into play, but also long term operators as well. So they have a lot of data, a lot of commitments. And we have Sunny from Interface. Interface, it's one of my favorite brands of all time. It's how I, it's one of the first things we worked with here in Shanghai. And what the process they've gone through from take make waste in the mid 90s to where they are now, it's, it's a great journey that I think everyone can learn from. Because it, it wasn't one big heat, it was little steps involved everyone in the organization, and it's, it came to a good end, and we keep going, which is amazing. Just thing to move forward. So I guess since you, most of you guys are not really working at those large factories, I'll just talk a little bit on the background. So can anyone suggest what is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now? As percentage? Yes, you can talk about it as percentage or something. I don't know. 10%. 10%? Uh, then we, we are all that now. <laughs> <laughs> That's 10%. So the percentage, in terms of percentage, that's 0.04%. Right. <laughs> um, we have about 21% of oxygen, 78% of hydrogen, and then carbon dioxide is actually like this, two tiny amount. And what it has changed was it changed from something like 280 ppm, that's part per million, so it's about 0.03% to 0.04% as what we are having right now. So the percentage change is very, very small. 
but it's, uh, it's because the speed that the carbon dioxide concentration has increased is too fast. That is why we need to think about some ways to deal with that. Uh, historically, there were periods that, uh, well, if we consider the Earth as a whole, the concentration of carbon dioxide is much higher than what we have right now. But it never faced the challenge of having this sudden increase in the concentration. So this is our problem, that everyone is trying to work together to solve this problem. And it's not a problem that can be solved by one individual country, or one in continent, or even two continents. It needs to be all the countries working together to solve this. And have you got any idea, like, um, how many countries have announced, not legally binding, but probably announced that they are going towards this carbon neutrality by 2050 or by 2060? Ten. Ten. Which, like, think about those ten countries. I think Japan is one of the I think Japan has one. Yeah. Germany? Uh, yes, European Union basically they announced so that can be counted as something like, it's like a, around 30. South Africa. Uh -huh, I, probably <laughs> yes. <laughs> Australia. Alright, Australia. Not, not sure. Uh, my, I have a map that shows this. The reason that I don't know which country they announced is because there are nearly 130 countries that has announced that they are going towards this carbon neutrality. It's not just China that we suddenly think, oh, China's announced we are the first one, we are one of the first. Uh, we are not. We are just going to work together with everyone else uh, on this problem. And some has announced that they are going to cut down the emission by 2050, some uh, 2060. And do you think this 10 years matters a lot? Like, yes. But do you know of the challenge that might China might be facing, even that's probably 10 years later than what the other most of the other countries announced that they are going to cut down the all the emissions by 2050. So for some of those developed countries, um, like US and also some of the European countries, also probably UK, they have from well, the time that they already reached the carbon peak emission to carbon neutrality they have around 70 years of at least 50 years. For China, they only got 30 years because we are still increasing. And any idea on the total amount of carbon dioxide that was emitted to the atmosphere last year in China? So we talk about this huge issue, but and, and when entrepreneurs come out and make a presentation, they talk about how big the market is, or how big the market is. No one knows. <laughs> no one knows. It's, it's huge, right? So yet last year, China emits around 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And going towards 2030, the target was something like 12 gigatons. So we still got another two gigatons of gas that we can grow the economy or continue emitting, and then after that, it need to go down or stable, keep it stable. But then um, one of the small differences that I picked up uh, last year after the announcement was made was that um, some of those companies always, well, oh, not a company, the government used to talk about China will emit something like 11.8, 11.6 gigaton of carbon dioxide. But then, last year, one of those big meetings, they said, suddenly talk about 12 gigaton. So there is a slight big difference in terms of like the total amount that can go up to the peak. Uh, personally, I consider this as some opportunity to grow the economy a little bit, because when we go down, go to the pathway to cut down carbon dioxide, uh, extra money and extra research need to be put down into different energy centers, or manufacturing centers. That also means extra like a cost, less profit for those companies. And, but giving them extra time to do this, this is one of the attitude change. And then how do we move from 2030 to 2060? That is probably going to be, in my idea is, we go up to the peak and then we come down. That's how you climb up the mountain. 
one of the uh, stable companies, large manufacturers, they talked to me about they can reach the carbon peaking for their company by 2023. It's a huge company. And then I asked them, what do you do after 2023? Why do you need to rush? Like the government's giving you another 10 years to continue emitting the carbon dioxide. Why do you need only need two years? They explained to me, um, we don't need to cut down the emission yet. We still get, got 30 years. So after I reach the peak, I'm not going to increase any of my productivity. I'll just keep it stabilized. And then by 2060, let's see what the government will do. So that's a, that's a leading company in one heavy polluting industry. I guess that will not be the only company that think I'll close after 30 years because most of the lifetime of a company is less than 30 years. So of course they will be closed by then. But it's just providing, uh, well, giving me some thoughts on those like um, more on the sustainable investment for new companies. If they are not stable, if they are, they don't want to close the business in 30 years time, maybe they need to think about something else. And then I, I was also considering if they, they can reach a line like this, what about those companies that reach a line like this? And I think for everyone that's coming to here, we are probably quite environmental friendly, that's why we are here. But maybe most of the, like the other 80% of the people are thinking an emission like, like this and then shut down, or an emission line like this and then shut down. So this is just some of my personal ideas. And then I was, uh, Brenda, or no Brenda, Hu Jing also asked me to provide something on the challenge that some of the manufacturers or industry might be facing. So um, I'll just talk about that quickly because um, to reach carbon neutrality, we need some works like these way and these way working together. When I say these way working together, that means we need to have different industry, maybe the power industry, or steel industry or cement industry, all trying to reach or zero by 2016. Another um, idea that we need to think about is for individual provinces within China or in the different countries, they need to reach their zero by 2060 or 2050. That means some of those industries will need to be negative emissions, while some industry, because they can't reach negative emissions, they will need to try to get close, as close as uh, well, to zero as possible. And there are different ways to go down to negative emissions. So six different ways, but if you sort of summarize that a little bit, um, one is called biomass carbon capture and storage. That means burning the biomass instead of coal in a power plant or a factory, and then capture those carbon dioxide. Because when trees are growing, they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So those carbon dioxide can, are already in those plants, and then it, got, it can get captured and stored on the ground. That is one way to go negative. The other one is direct air capture. That means capturing the carbon dioxide directly from the air. So we talk about the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 0.04% at the very beginning. But in this room, while we are talking and also drinking beer, the concentration of carbon dioxide in this room is already probably 0.06%. You might sound like uh, I felt more and more sleepy. It's be not because uh, my topic is really boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's because the increase in co carbon dioxide concentration within this room. So that's why you feel sleepy. With the that's why when you go to a forest, you feel mm, um, it's very refreshing. I can wake up at five o'clock in the morning without any problem. It's because of the concentration. So direct air capture. What we can do about this is we can put some device probably similar to um, um, air purifier, but then you put it as a carbon dioxide purifier within a room. But the concentration is small, uh, but it's very low, so it will be slightly more expensive than capturing those from large stationary uh, emission sources. Because in those emission sources, the carbon dioxide concentration could be something like 5%, 10%, or even 99%. So that's slightly different. And then the other 
um, things that we can talk about or think about is afforestation. That means putting more trees up and selective trees. So not all kinds of trees. Because when trees are growing, it's like when kids are growing, they eat a lot and then they absorb all the nutrition. Well, and when trees grow older, they don't absorb as much carbon dioxide as what they used to do. So there was a lifetime of the trees. It's normally suggested to be less than but to be around 30 to 50 years, that is the, probably a good time to chop down those trees and burn it in a power plant for with biomass carbon capture. And then the last one, which also provides the, well, the largest sink of carbon dioxide is ocean storage. So carbon dioxide will react with ocean seawater and that just got sort of uh, dissolved in the seawater. So those are the four main ways to solve this problem. The other thing also including putting mirrors in the space. So stand a rock here and put a mirror there and then the mirror will reflect the sunlight <coughs> so it keeps the sun away and then in that way we can reduce the global temperature. Uh, also we can do something more extraordinary that's called uh, dual engineering. That means putting uh, sulfur aerosols like get an airplane, spray the sulfur aerosols on the surface, well, no, in the sky. And then it will help to absorb those carbon dioxide a little bit. Or you can put um, some steelworks buried down the ground. It will react with the seawater and then absorb the carbon dioxide much faster. But in those two different situations, it's going to create some other problem, ecological, uh, ecology problems. So that's the way that's not so well being suggested. So it's all mainly those four different ways. So uh, within those solutions, because my research is linked directly with two of those, biomass ca uh, carbon capture and direct air capture. So that's why I suddenly become really busy. And everyone thinks, OK, you can help to solve this problem. But if you consider, like for the last 16 years, I've been sitting in my lab happily, just having a world-life balance. And now it's all sort of unbalanced. So this is uh, my sharing, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I think we will bring everyone back up afterwards. All right, so I'm going to do a really quick swap. And next we're going to have a tag team performance, like it's the American Wrestling Federation. Yeah. Um, hopefully we can get this going. We realize we can't move. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. So a bit of introduction first. My name. My name is Fun. Um, I run the uh, British China business for CBRE. Um, so you didn't come here to hear about CBRE, um, but before I start, I want a little confession. I'm not an expert in sustainability. So you ask why am I here, right? Um, I think what I bring is really um, a passion about sustainability. Um, I'm going to try and relate the bigger problem of sustainability around real estate. Um, the tag team, Peter, is much more knowledgeable in the technical side, but I'm going to try and address the sustainability problem in real estate through just normal people. Because I am an expert, right? So um, please bear with me. But I mean, how many people have watched Game Changer? You know the documentary about you know, and you know I don't know how you felt when you watched that documentary, but after I watched it, I thought, wow, um, actually, what I thought was contributing to carbon emission is not actually the industry. So the, the th first takeaway I want you to get away from this presentation is actually, you know, the, the space that we occupy contribute a lot to carbon emission as well. Right? And maybe it's the thing that you know about already. Um, but hopefully, um, you know, with Peter talking about the solution, we can start with a problem and then you can have some solution that comes with it. Um, so some statistics. Um, I think the first one, the energy used in buildings is around 20%. Everyone, everyone knows this, right? So the main thing, you know, around carbon usage in buildings is the heating and cooling of buildings. Um, so I think this is general knowledge. I mean, it shouldn't be, there's no wow factor there. 
But um, actually, what we don't look at is the input to the buildings. You know, um, I was just talking to Christopher. I'll, I'll call out your company as well. Who happens to make renewable, renewable material, right? They compress straw into, um, as I understand, building materials, which are you know much less in terms of carbon emission. So, um, but if you take the, the input in terms of building materials and the steel that you know, uh, Professor Lee talked about, actually the combined carbon emission around the real estate space around 50%, which is quite a big chunk of the emission that we're dealing with, especially in countries like China, where there's a lot of infrastructure that's been built. Right. Uh, so the next the next slide I'm gonna talk about is uh, this is pretty technical, but you know Peter's responsible for this. I'm just trying to understand it and you know summarize. But really, on the input side, you've got all the materials that goods in. Yeah. So if we ask ourselves where can we make the difference, I think if there's any architect in the room, um, by you know, or developers, if you choose better materials, you know, I know there's big justification around that, but if we just make those early decisions up front, then um, you know, then perhaps you know, it, the, the overall process in terms of carbon emission will be less. Um, you know, electricity, renewable energy, that's all be addressed a lot, but um, you'd be when you walk into this building, actually, you know, uh, you see the LEED certification, right? Um, but most people don't ask, is, is it LEED design and build or is it LEED EV, right? So even within these certification, um, there's nuances that are slightly different, right? So um, this building is LEED certified design and build. It means that the design aspect is, you know, it has all the tick in the box. But in terms of LEED EV, are they running the building um, as best as they can, most efficiently as they can. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making a statement, but you know, there is another standard that we can apply, right? So, I think for all of us here, you know, again, I'm not technical, but in, in terms of relating to a problem, I think it starts with us because as consumer, um, you guys really have a choice, right? So, you know, when you choose to lease a space. Um, you know, do you choose a building that's EV certified? Um, do you choose a building that's well certified? Um, you know, versus a building that is not, right? So, I think there are choices that you know each of us can make. Um, but from a CBRE perspective, I mean, I don't want to put on too much of a sales pitch. But um, in terms of the in, in real estate, there's a lot we can do in terms of how we can push the green agenda. Um, I mean, what, what we do is we, we manage space and property uh, on, on behalf of some of the developers. So um, we, we simply offer a solution. But if the economy and the market is not there to buy the more sustainable products, then ultimately um, we end up with the same problem. So um, for the next section, Peter is going to come on and talk a bit about some of the solutions. Um, So same thing is fun. Okay, the my name is Peter Peterson. I'm working at the CIE into leading the energy and the sustainability, uh, sustainability discussions. <coughs> yeah. Um. For I was the major in environment engineering for my bachelor degree and uh, uh, the major engineering the, for my master degree. Environment uh, engineering most of the young yeah, will be involved the yeah, the related for the. Um, uh, environmental the, the automation no help for me the for the energy. During my past most of the it's on induction side. So the, for uh CPIE, yeah the, we are the providing the total solution the, for uh, the clients on buildings. Yeah right now the are more than more the clients is uh, yeah, the asking for the just total and the energy the solutions. So we are talking about the energy and the solutions. First, we need a framework on the methodology. The how you manage the your buildings, how you manage the your energy, the uh, use, the consumes. There are other, we have a lot of clients. Yeah, that they have installed a lot of the meters, but actually they cannot help them very effectively. And how can the yeah the consume the the how well the consume them. So in the right now, they are coding them. They are a lot of the, just in the new the technology. We code the digital solutions. That and then, yeah. 
uh, starting from the we call the spark in the middle. Yeah, and uh, you have to then to get you those in the utilities. Then, yeah, and they are in the accurate and then also uh, structure the information that they will be helping them to understand in the what in the you and uh, any users that can share. Yeah, and then so um, with this one, then, then we need to have um, the, the platform yeah, to yeah, get all of this information the, from meters the, into the central the platform to conduct and, and those the data programming then to evaluate the, um, the energy and yeah, the, those the use consumers on different uh, levels. Starting the for like the individual equipment level, like in the bank, your funds, and the how efficient that you operate, and then to system level, like in the you you have the chain of plant, yeah, and the how efficient that you run on your chain of plant, and then building level, and you can see the how total efficient you are, and then yeah, and after you get in the those in the different the scale, in the different the levels of energy and the efficiency. Then you can conduct the research on the benchmarking, yeah, and against like the assurance, the those the benchmarking, and also in China the TV code, the China they have uh, uh, published a lot of those the new uh, energy the efficient level for the domestic buildings, and also the for different sectors the efficiency. And then we, we can see in them how is the gap. In them. You are performing very well on the performing averaging and or performing the below. Then you you have the view and then you see in them how bad you are and then how much in the area you can you improve. So we we actually for this part and we developed and also we partner the in the some our partners in the development of the platform, then to the function of the uh, platform. Okay, so uh, before the we see on um, the energy the efficiency and also and there are a lot of the uh, yeah the kind the uh, on the yeah and um, they are actually they are wondering the how the efficiency and how the baseline and how so they are very important important tools the yeah the we call the assessment on the audit them. You start in the end of the yeah, even if you have the good and the engineers, yeah. Um, well, yeah, and that will be in the set up and the build and the baselines, yeah, and the your efficient level. And then through those and the, yeah, and the cycles and the yeah, engineer review and the also assessment and the also the tips, you can see, yeah, and then. And yeah, and, um, the guy and then the also and then the improvement the areas. For those the you can then yeah and the work out the solution we call the having three the yeah uh, based on the yeah the cost and yeah and the, yeah in investment uh, we call the low cost and yeah and the, yeah initiatives and the low cost and the, some the capital and the project and the yeah hard cost yeah. That we will be helping the to, to to continue the job in the new energy and the and the also in the building operating the efficiency. Yeah, there are a lot of the those things too. And then, yeah, I think I think just just from some of the experience we on the low cost front, um, we'd be surprised because we deal with a lot of common areas. Um, just by installing automated switch for sensors to, to switch on and off air cons, save huge amount of energy. I mean, the amount of clients that we have where, you know, they, they have things running 24 by sevens and, you know, just by tuning one or two degree down when you're heating a whole building, it is, is a lot, right? So, yeah. I mean, your father always you know, tells you to switch the light off and, you know, turn things off. Those little practice, if we actually pick those, common practice that we have at home and apply it in a commercial environment, you, you'd be surprised how much energy you actually save. And, you know, you'd be, you know, if you look around the buildings, actually in China, a lot of the construction, they, they spend money on these, you know, building management system, but they don't hook it up. You'd be surprised that they spend the capex to install the system, but it's not configured because, you know, during the building process, they didn't do the testing commissioning properly. So, you know, 
we we're now going back and you know i think china went through this rapid expansion and just kept building 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 um i, I think there will be a time where you know there's, there's still a huge amount of you know efficiency i think that we, we can get fine so yeah I think yes. low cost space, low co I mean, a lot of people think, you, you know, we're, we're building, it costs a lot of money, but a lot of times it's not. It's just making sure people close the window in the summer. I mean, you know, and making sure people don't smoke in, inside and, you know, when people open the window. I mean, it's, it's stuff like that. You, you know, you put in a no smoking policy and you find, you know, indirectly, just for behavior change, you, you know, you, you can drive, drive some uh, energy safe. Yeah. Actually, in the, for most of the building, or for most of the, yeah, the systems currently, in the, not in the, yeah, in the operate the, and the, the best the efficiency level, yeah. And so the other why the after the first the building, okay, operating the for for few years, and the, they are needed to code and the re eventually the commissioning that is to the to fit the, the best level. Okay, the another part of the we call the workplace and the many they are most of the yeah ready in the office. And for the those of the many that will be the much the easier to do to the improve the for the grain and the many at the office. And we normally we call it this we are the to reduce um reduce the energy consumption, reduce the water consumption and then the second is the reuse and the recycling. Yeah, the from the your your procurement policies and the and the by some recyclable and then just the materials, yeah. And also the decreasing the just the waste and the reducing the just the emission, yeah. Okay, and then we should the uh, case study the yeah and the Angela come, yeah, and there is in the um, the regional accounts and then we are the what yeah, in the um, operating the own the manufacturing and the in also office. And, for this, for this time, there are some high in the plant that we will build in the, uh, in the zone out in the plant for them. Yeah, and that in the, um, they are paid back in the right now, and they, they it's much better than before. It's a 4.5 million dollars to get the return. And um, I really in them can reduce in the 350 in the tonnages in the CO2 reductions. So, yeah, this is the it will be very good in the renewable and the energy to, to, to support the distance um, so I'm very pleased. Yeah. Okay, and um, that's that's all from my side. And last but not least we have Sunny. So solar and sunny. Solar and sunny. Uh, thank you so much and good evening everyone. I I try to make my presentation a little funny or interesting because you give up the bar straight there nearby <laughs> and join uh, such a you know serious topic with us. So my topic is why interface because uh, we have professors around you know the low carbon serious projects and we got CBRE who is the expertise to measurement the buildings. But who is interface? Actually, we are a floor solutions provider. And probably just a you know, tiny piece of the building and uh, you're not really paying a lot of attention to. But just like you know, Peter said, uh, some of the carbon savings only just easy to like, uh, close the window and smoke outside. That is why, oh sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's too fast, sorry. <laughs> so that's not that difficult because we are we are uh, normal manufacturers in the world. I think there are uh, millions this kind of manufacturers available in the world. But think about if all of them can achieve this target, probably everyone can. So let's start from our planet. Everyone know actually the Earth don't need people. We need the Earth. Why? Because the planet, she can healing herself if we didn't have too much people or we didn't have too much industrial work. So let me show you, this is in 1973, which is uh, the first carpet uh, made in US. This is the first manufacturer for interface in Atlanta. So this is a typical pollution business in that moment but they made huge margin as a moment. That is why people is so 
uh, you know, illusionary to drive the margins and business growth, but nobody really care the environment and also the people's well-being. And this guy actually realized after being a public company owner in 19, uh, in 1980 somewhere, some, uh, somewhere, Ray Anderson, he is our founders. And I think that in the last 20 years of uh, his life, he just realized we gained too much from the earth and we broken the nature balance too much. We need to actually give them something. We need to heal something through our business, through what we're doing daily. That is why we built this mission zero uh, you know, project in the world. So what we do in 1994, uh, you know, everybody thinks Ray is crazy because nobody understands what is a mission zero and how we are going to achieve that. But we set this, uh, up this mission and uh, we start to think about how to make, you know, this mission achieved seriously. So after 25 years. I, I'm not going to talk about too much the journeys because it's cost you eight hours sitting here, listen to me. So I just show you some results. Actually, is um, you know we can see we are the largest modular car manufacturers in the world, and after 25 years, we achieved this list to make our manufacturer being zero. We have zero frame point to our environment. So if a tiny small Carbon company can do why you cannot. And this is a small, tiny factory based in uh, Suzhou, very close to Shanghai. And you all will come to have a visit with me too, with me. Uh, so we we get the LEED certificates for this uh, small facility. So if you uh, have the mutual, you will see actually it's uh, quite easy. We didn't launch. We didn't run a new buildings. We didn't rebuild the building. We just run some, you know, technical park in the current place, and we didn't use any piece of the uh, construction materials for new. Everything is renovated from some residential house, like rocks in the floor, and also, uh, you know, as much as possible, your con construction materials is recycled. And all the factories has been made by solar protection. So like Peter or CBS team said, you will close the window automatically. You didn't need to mention people, oh, you need to close your window when you feel we will need smoke. So they save a lot of energies in this factory. And you know, when we do in manufacturers in the process, the water will be needed and they will be heated because you have machine need cooling down. But but how to deal with this uh, water because there will be waste. Actually, we use some systems to recycle the water for the people's bathroom <laughs> or something you can use that. So any tiny things in this factory doesn't do go to landfill is the permissions we made for ourselves and to our customers. So that's the tiny things we, we, we try to keep our permits for manufacturing side. And of, all, of course, our products, we also try to use uh, low carbon materials mm -hmm. and the most uh, brand new technology to achieve this carbon neutral floor. So we got this uh, certificate and uh, we're still quite proud of this uh, achievement because it's really rare in China for a manufacturer. Uh, and of course, we use uh, this, uh, you know, green energies. But don't be, don't make me wrong. We didn't have this uh, funds in the factory. <laughs> we just donation our margins to Mongolia, so we can buy this green energies. And uh, in China, there is a lot of this kind of, uh, you know, green energy available for your manufacturer. So if you uh, want to get this energy, it's far more easy. And also, we recycle products because it's a, a very important footprint to the earth. Because think about if you use some floors or carpets, when the product life is end, where they will go? If nobody will take them back. So we set up this uh, uh, programs called reentry. So 
uh, all interface carpets. If you don't want to use them, if uh, this is out of the service, you can call in us and we can you know, take them back to our factory and sweep them and make them into a new carpet with new floors. Until we built this factory in uh, 2017, we already recycled 1 million square meters carpet in China. That is a phenomenon because uh, uh, many of the manufacturers, they claim they can recycle the products, but unfortunately, you have to recycle them within or as close as possible to your uh, you know, market. Because uh, if you recycle them, for example, to US or UK, they will need more carbons for the transportations. So that is a key point, why we have to do the local uh, recycles for your product. And of course, uh, you know, all our manufacturers, it's not only for China, we have uh, actually uh, three manufacturers in Asia, uh, we have Thailand one, Australia one, and also we have one big factory in US, we have two factories in uh, you know, Europe. All these factories use same standard, same process, and we keep same missions to our customers. And uh, I'm quite a proud of is, uh, um, till uh, 2020, all of these manufacturers achieved mission zero. So, um, and of course, we didn't stop there for their role. Uh, we started thinking what we can do more. And one film is published in, I think, 2013. Someone started to pay a lot of attention to the sea because we saw a lot of birds just suddenly died. We don't know why it just died. And then some uh, photographers, that's why I invited Bob, because he's a uh, photographer. Uh, photographers first to pay this attention to why the birds suddenly died. And then they start to study that. Actually, they eat too much plastics or you know, the, this kind of um, nylons or you know, fish nets in the sea. Because they, they cannot distinguish what is wrong they're eating. So we start this program with um, uh, you know uh, ZSL, which is uh, CSR in UK, and we start to recycle this uh, uh, fish net from sea in Philippines and uh, South Af Africa until uh, you know this uh, 2000 I think uh, 17th figure. We already recycled 224 tons from the sea. And all this uh, you know, net fit, we recycle that and we rebuild these materials into our carpet. So you will, you probably will heard uh, one of the famous ranches called uh, Net Effect. This designed like the oceans, the pattern is like oceans. You, you will have the a blue color and you will have a, a, a pattern just looked like uh, the sea, but the materials made by this recycled uh, fish net. If you have more interesting, I will speak other for you know for hours for this project as well. So just let me know if you have interesting. There's uh, another very interesting project, very tiny one. We call this a uh, uh, weave a better life because it's made by the waste yarn we we use to temperature our carpet. This teddy bear actually is very popular among the, our you know audience like designers. They love that. Uh, they made. Uh, by uh, our waste young because you always have this young cannot use out and we donation this young to some you know local poor peoples in the valley in Thailand and also uh, you know in, in China we also found some uh, you know partners can weave this uh, young into this uh, lovely you know toys and we actually sell them to the people who want them or love them and then we donation the money to the children who need education and which uh, and the families we need food so this is another program uh, we feel is working well and so far we already uh, actually donate around 126 tons young to um, uh, this project I have other members how many people we already donate since 2013 and if you have interesting just reach on me I can share more for these details and after all these projects and uh, we become the lowest you know the carbon uh, 
product, flow products in the world. So this is a figure published in US. You could see the two blue one is from interface. And uh, we only cost, uh, the lowest cost of carbon is around uh, four tons each meters, each square meters. So maybe you, if you didn't familiar with the system, normally these figures, even the highest one of 21, is still quite sustainable. If you check the wood or stone, it's probably uh, average carbon is around 40, 60. So if you got the you know, comparison, there will be amazing figures. So you can see all of these players is uh, our competitors. We don't mind, you know, they follow us in these directions. We hope all the competitors can, you know, work in the same directions. And also we think it's, uh, uh, you know, this is big uh, committees for sustainability missions. We are not compete just uh, for your products. We actually made people survive in the planet for the same direction. So it's, it's more like um, our, you know, a billboard for this industry. Everybody wants to be one of them. And this is why it's so popular in floor business. You know, sustainability is kind of uh, your soul. If you are not sustainable brand, probably you are not so uh, easy to survive in such a, uh, you know, you know, uh, computations in China. And that doesn't stop us because uh, we are a little bit uh, further than uh, Chinese government because we claim in 2018 all our floor is carbon neutral floor already. And uh, some people will may ask the questions. We still have, you know, 4.4 kilos each uh, square meter. So how you guys made that part? Uh, you know, carbon neutral. Uh, the answer is we, we, we donate many projects like uh, to plant tree in Amazon and also we donation some projects in China to replace, uh, you know, uh, the woods burning in, in the village. And, uh, and of course we uh, uh, also donation other CSRs in the world. If you want more details, also we, I can uh, share uh, the detail in EP EPD report. So, we are probably the first one carbon neutral floor in the world, and we will continue to, you know, um, uh, go on our journeys for sustainability. So, what is uh, oh, this is a certificate actually we can we can offer to our customer to also share the journeys with our customer to share the benefits we contribute for the uh, carbon neutral world. But what is next? It's not stop us because. Um, you already carbon neutral, but we think we can do, you know, carbon negative. In 2021, actually, we launched the first, uh, you know, carbon negative carbon in US and, uh, uh, you know, European. And uh, in last month, we just launched this product in China. So it's another long story. So don't ask me how you achieve that because it's cost other eight hours probably. So I will end in there and give you some space to think about that. And if you have any questions or uh, you know uh, want to interesting to interface story or journeys, just reach on me. I'm Sunny. I'm I'm here to you know connect with you. Thank you guys for joining. Us. Thank you. So next month we're actually talking about powering sustainability. Now I haven't asked Sunny yet. I've done the tour three times. It's amazing. On top of actually having three executives from the solar energy, battery, and also we're talking one more that will that'll take the stage here. Yeah. We will be going to the JA solar facility in Fengxian as well, uh, probably the week after, like the 22nd, 23rd. But two months after that, we'll be talking about the circular economy, and I'm hoping that we can go to the interface factory as well. So scan the QR code to learn more, because as we push announcements out, we will be offering about 25 to 30 spaces